A 2013 Reader's Digest poll revealed that Americans trusted Judge Judy more than all nine justices of the United States Supreme Court. Hi friends, welcome. Yes, yeah, things look a little bit different today. This is the set of my new RuPaul's Drag Race reaction show on a separate YouTube channel that I started where we literally just talk about RuPaul's Drag Race and nothing else, no law, nothing deep. We're just talking about looks and fashion and runways and contests. Okay, if you're interested in that, I'll link it somewhere up here. You can go check it out after this video, obviously, but that's my shameless plug for that. In case you missed it, this week's episode of All Star 7 featured a legal scene or a couple legal scenes, Fairy Tale Justice, where each of the queens had a character based on fairy tale stories and they had to improv a court scene with some of the other queens. We had the three little pigs versus the big bad wolf, and we had the three bears and some other characters versus. Goldilocks, or was it Goldilocks? And I made a separate video over on that other channel as part of my series reviewing this season of RuPaul's Drag Race, where we talk all about the whole episode and my thoughts on the acting and the improv and the outfits and everything. That's separate, but in this video, I wanted to just talk about the legal aspect of this. Obviously, of course, it is based on fairy tale. It is not that deep. It's not real life. It's not meant to even seem like real life. I'm not trying to make it that way. I just wanted to share with you some interesting stuff I discovered because I was inspired by seeing this and I wanted to do a little digging into court TV, Judge Judy, how that all works and how close it actually is to reality. And I thought maybe you'd be interested in learning about what I discovered. So that's the question today. Fairy tale justice, this RuPaul's Drag Race contest, improv contest, was inspired clearly by court TV. The whole setup looks exactly like an episode of Judge Judy. So is Judge Judy even remotely realistic in itself? Okay, clearly we know that. The Drag Race one, not realistic. It's literally fairy tale characters and the audience is full of stuffed animals. Like we get it, okay? But what about Judge Judy? Is it real or not? Let's discuss. First, let's talk about Judge Judy herself because I find her story kind of fascinating. So Judge Judy is 79 years old. She was born October 21st, 1942 in Brooklyn, New York, which makes her a Libra, which frankly is a little unexpected, but sometimes the Zodiac doesn't seem right, but maybe she's got a kooky rising sign. Her name at birth was Judith Susan Bloom. She was born to Jewish parents, a German Jewish and Russian Jewish parents. She graduated from James Madison High School in Brooklyn and then went on to American University in Washington, D.C., where she got her bachelor's degree. And then she went to New York Law School, getting her JD and graduating in 1965. I say it the year that way because that's a long fucking time ago. <laughs> New York Law School. I don't think that's, is that still a thing? Oh, it is still a thing. Huh. Never even heard of it. That's been around for 125 years. What do I know? All right, so she graduates 1965, takes the bar, passes the bar in New York that same year, and then she goes on to work at a in-house counsel job for a cosmetics company, I think, which is surprising to me because it seems like you can't these days just get a job in-house as a, an attorney for a large company. Like you need a bit more training than that. So that's not typical for a lawyer these days. And that's kind of interesting. 1965 is like five years after Ruth Bader Ginsburg graduated from law school. If you've seen any of her like biopics or anything, you know that she really struggled to find a job at a large law firm after she graduated. And she was like the only woman of maybe five women total who were went to and Harvard. She went to Harvard first and then transferred to Columbia. I don't know the exact numbers, but like not, there were like a handful of women at each place. So Judge Judy was going to law school when like women weren't really going to law school. I don't know if New York law school was a little bit more liberal with women and it was more the Ivy Leagues that still were really exclusionary. I'm not entirely sure, but that's how old we're talking here, okay? <laughs> so she worked at this cosmetics company and maybe she was able to get that job because, you know, women like cosmetics. And that's the only way she could find a job is if she worked in a traditionally woman-centered field. I don't know. Anyway, so she works at this cosmetic company for a couple of years, hates it, quits, and has two kids and raises those kids, which honestly I love. This is why I love reading biographies of other attorneys, because 
when you are an attorney, you get this idea that there is a very specific path that you have to follow to be successful as a lawyer. And it's really great to see other attorneys who haven't followed that path. Like Ruth Bader Ginsburg couldn't find a job. So she took a job teaching, which eventually led to where she ended up in her career. Elizabeth Warren quit for a while to raise kids and then like was doing some tax law on the side. And now she's where she's at. So it's inspiring to see other, especially women, minority lawyers, forging their own path in this field. And, you know, whatever you think about Judge Judy, she did the same thing. Okay, so she takes some time off to be a parent. And then like five years later, in 1972, she takes a job as a prosecutor in the New York family court system, where she prosecuted child abuse, domestic violence, and things like that. And she was making a name for herself as this hardball, this no-nonsense lawyer. So she was like prosecuting child abusers and stuff in family courts. Okay, and then a decade later, 1982, she had really made this name for herself as a no-nonsense attorney and prosecutor. And so she was appointed as a criminal court judge in New York in 1982. And then she was promoted four years later to the presiding overseeing judge in the family court system in Manhattan, which like that sounds like a rough job. There's got to be a lot going on there. And she earned a reputation for being a tough judge, which can mean a lot of different things. Is she tough on the parents? Is she tough on the prosecutors? Who's she tough on? Is she just mean? Is she unreasonable? There's a lot of things that the word tough can mean when describing a judge. Okay, then by 1993, so a reminder, she was appointed a judge in 82. So that's, you know, a decade later, she's been sitting as a judge in court in Manhattan. And she has really, again, made a name for herself and a reputation. And she became the subject of a Los Angeles Times article who profiled her as this woman who was determined to make the court system work for the better good, like in a very positive light, which then led to a 60 minutes segment that she was featured on, which is kind of how she grew to the national stage. And from there, she wrote a book. Brilliant. Who doesn't write a book once they get a little taste of fame? I'm sure mine will come out in the next couple of years. <laughs> and her book is titled Don't Pee on My Leg and Tell Me It's Raining. That's funny. And that was published in 1996. And in 96, she also retired from being a judge. She was only 54 when she retired from the bench, but maybe it's because she knew that she had a, a destiny to become famous, but she didn't become famous till 54. Okay, so it's never too late. And then from there, she went on to begin the series Judge Judy in 1996. It's when she heard her first case in the courtroom. And that ran for 25 seasons until July, 2021. And her bailiff named Petri Hawkins Bird, who she just called Officer Bird, he was there with her for all 25 years. That's loyalty. And her show was number one amongst all court TV shows that whole time. And I think partially it's because of her no nonsense, no bullshit attitude where she could kind of say a lot of mean things to people, but it's sometimes what we were all thinking. And I think the, the draw of court TV is just that it is petty drama between strangers that we get to watch play out. And Judge Judy is the voice that we're all thinking in the back of our head about these people. Humans are notoriously nosy. That's why we love reality TV. And Judge Judy type shows allow us to get tiny little snippets of drama in like bite-sized pieces that are easy to digest. And we kind of get to become the judges, even though Judge Judy says what she thinks and makes her own rulings. Like it puts us in the position of judge and jury and a lot of people really grab onto that. And that's why this show has been popular for 25 years. A 2013 Reader's Digest poll revealed that Americans trusted Judge Judy more than all nine justices of the United States Supreme Court. That's where we're at as a society, my friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she made a fortune on this. In 2005, her salary was reportedly $25 million per year. By 2011, her salary rose to $47 million per year, which works out to a little over $900,000 per workday because she worked a total of 52 days per year, which if you're keeping track, that's one day a week. <laughs> she was working one day a week, making $47 million. And by 2017, she earned $147 million in one year. In 2013, it was reported that she was the highest paid TV star. Like this woman, the grip she's had on our country for 25 years. <laughs> okay, and then of course, she retired after the 25th season of Judge Judy, but old Judy, she's not done, okay? Now she has a new show called Judy Justice. It's a court spinoff. I think it's the same thing. It's through Amazon. It is apparently a more hip rendition of Judge Judy with Gen Z input from Judge Judy's own granddaughter. They also have a stenographer now who can quote back what 
Judge Judy and the litigants are saying. And she wears a more conspicuous robe color and the courtroom set has been modernized. So Judge Judy is not done, even though Judge Judy the show ended. You know what I mean? 79, she's still kicking. Okay, that's the background of Judge Judy's career. Uh, Her personal life in 1964, so the year before she graduated law school, she married Ronald Levy, who later became a prosecutor in juvenile court. They had two kids, Jamie and Adam. They divorced in 1976 after 12 years of marriage. And then in 1977, so one year later, she married Judge Jerry Scheindlin, which is her last name now. Her name is Judy Scheindlin. And he was an arbitrator on the People's Court from 1999 to 2001. Very, very, very short lived career. They divorced in 1990 briefly and then remarried a year later. (laughs) She owns homes in several states, including Connecticut, New York, Florida, California, and Wyoming. And then she commutes to Los Angeles every other week for two to four days to tape episodes of Judge Judy. Oh, and then she bought a $10 million condo in LA. Politically, she's a registered independent. She supports same-sex marriage. She's not a supporter of big government, but she is in favor of increasing requirements for gun ownership. She voted for Obama in 2008, but Reagan in the 80s and Bill Clinton in the 90s. She endorsed Michael Bloomberg for president in 2019, and she campaigned alongside Michael Bloomberg during his 2020 campaign. So she really does kind of straddle the liberal Republican lines. Fascinating. What a fascinating woman. What a life to have lived. Anyway, so that's Judge Judy. Let's talk about the show Judge Judy and if it's actually, you know, a realistic interpretation of court. Well, here's a fun fact. Judge Judy's courtroom is not a courtroom. That's not real court. It's not a state courtroom. It's not a federal courtroom. It's not court. It's actually arbitration. After Judge Judy retired from being a judge in 1996 or whenever it was, she became an arbitrator. Arbitration is a process that you go through instead of going into public court, you arbitrate with a neutral third party who then makes a judgment after hearing all of the evidence facts, whatever that you have to present to them. It's a lot cheaper than going through the full court system. It's faster than going through the full court system. And the arbitrator's judgment is binding, meaning that if she says you have to pay this person money and then you don't pay them money, that person can go to actual court and say, hey, they owed me this money, they have to pay it. Or if you sue someone and she says you're wrong, you shouldn't have sued them, you can't then go into state court and sue them again. Like it's a binding judgment, even though it's not actually happening in court. That's what arbitration is. You might have heard of arbitration in the context of arbitration clauses. Most contracts generally tend to have arbitration clauses, which say that if there is a dispute over this contract, you agree to arbitrate in X state and X person gets to choose the arbitrator. You'll see it in like any contract you sign when you sign up for like a website. If you sign Like if you're going on a cruise or something and you have to sign, oh, you know, a liability waiver, there's usually an arbitration clause and the person, whoever wrote, whatever company wrote the contract, they're going to make the arbitration clause say you have to arbitrate in whatever state where they are headquartered and we're going to pick the arbitrator. And then they probably have a list of arbitrators that they trust who they then will have on call anytime there's a dispute. And the way, and the reason they do this is because it's not public, it's private, which means that they can settle things behind closed doors without a bunch of information getting public. It's cheaper and it's faster and it's in their own home court and they get to choose who arbitrates. Arbitrators are bound by like certain ethics, but not in the way that judges are. Um, But you know, an arbitrator still has a reputation they want to keep. They're going to try to be as impartial as possible, typically speaking. Um, So that's what arbitration is. Judge Judy is an arbitrator. Usually arbitration happens in like a conference room around a table. You've got one party sitting on one side of the table, the arbitrator in the middle, and the other party on the other side. Arbitrators aren't judges. They don't have to have been judges. They do have to be lawyers, I think, most of the time. Um, but they usually are advanced in their career. So they've like seen it all. They have good judgment. They understand the law and people trust them and they've built like a good reputation for themselves. Uh, It's something that a lot of people who are like partners at big law firms, but don't want to do full-time law firm work anymore. They'll leave big law firm. They'll become a mediator or an arbitrator. So it's less formal than court. The rules of state court, for example, don't apply in arbitration. There are no rules of evidence. There are no rules of like witnesses and how to question witnesses. It's literally just like you just show the arbitrator all the information you have. 
argue your case and then the arbitrator makes a decision. So it also means that like things that would be barred in state court won't be barred in arbitration. There's a lot more leeway. It's easier. It's like laid back court basically, but it does not occur in courtrooms. Judge Judy is an arbitrator. The people who are coming before her have agreed to arbitration. The way that it works is her show network, whatever. They typically reach out to people to see if they want to instead of going to small claims court or a private arbitration, if they want to come on Judge Judy's show and be public with it. I once worked with a guy who I think what happened is someone like drove their car into his house, you know, like driving, driving, go off the road, careen into his like front living room area. And he was taking them to small claims court to get them to pay him for the damages. And Judge Judy's team like reached out to him to see if he wanted to arbitrate on the show because that's a great story. Obviously, it's going to make good TV. So they reached out to him. I think he ended up declining. Um, but that's what that's what they do. They I think they kind of just like troll small claims court looking for like what's coming up next. What are the disputes? And then they reach out to people. Um, I don't know. They probably took also requests from people who wanted to be on the show. The reason why I think people agreed to be on the show was, I mean, it was a very famous show. 15 Minutes of Fame is a great, you know, motivator for some people, but also they paid people to be on the show. I believe the arrangement was either if the plaintiff wins, then the show paid the plaintiff whatever the defendant owed them. So the defendant didn't owe any money if they lost, which then makes sense because then if a plaintiff's like, I'm taking you to Judge Judy, a defendant probably, if they're in the wrong, isn't gonna wanna go on you know, national television and say that. But then if they say like, well, if you lose, like we'll pay for it. It's a great incentive to get someone on the show. But if the plaintiff lost, if they found that like there was no liability, both parties still got paid. Like they were just paid for their time for being present and appearing on the show. So like people made money, or at the very least didn't lose money if they went on the show, which was a great motivator to get people on the show. And that's allowed because arbitration, again, it's pretty willy nilly. There's not a lot of rules, you know, around how it works because people are agreeing to do it. They're signing a contract saying like, yes, I'm going to give up my right to go to court over this and I'm going to arbitrate in front of Judge Judy on national TV instead. And signing that means that like they're signing away their right to like everything that comes with bringing your case in traditional state court or small claims court. But again, it's really attractive to, for people because they're getting paid or at the very least, they don't have to pay damages that, that they owe to someone and they're getting their 15 minutes of fame. Another fun fact about arbitration is that the judges, the arbitrators, they are governed by less intense rules than like a traditional judge, but they also get arbitrator immunity. So they can't be sued over what happens during the arbitration process, which is why someone like Judge Judy is able to say really defamatory things during the show, like call people names, say they're stupid, like not really have to filter themselves or censor themselves because they have arbitrator immunity. They can't get sued for defamation down the road. So it gave her a lot of leeway to just like be the tough talking, no bullshit person that she had to kind of build her reputation up to be, which is also why her ratings were so good because People love people who are no bullshit, straight talking types of people. So it was like this perfect storm of petty drama, reality TV, a no bullshit judge like character every day on daytime TV that you could watch anytime you were homesick from school or reruns whenever you wanted. It is a really fascinating look at um, the arbitration process. The problem is that Shows like Judge Judy give people a very skewed idea of what court is actually like because they make the set look like a courtroom, which again, they're allowed to do. Arbitration can happen literally anywhere. You can arbitrate in a McDonald's if you wanted to. It usually happens in a conference room or somewhere really boring, um, but they made a set in Hollywood that looks like a courtroom and they're allowed to do that. And so people watch Judge Judy and think this is what court looks like. This is how some judges act. I mean, some judges do kind of act like that, but like, this is how a court proceeding 
unfolds, even though there are no rules of evidence and other rules for like witnesses and things like that in arbitration. So when they're calling up witnesses, when they're referring to evidence, when they're showing her things, when, you know, they're testifying and all of that, none of that is conforming to the rules of court. But viewers don't know that. So they watch this thinking like if I were to walk into any court, small claims court or state court or whatever, like this is what I'd see. No, not the case. Not the case at all. But it is, you know, a fun charade, if nothing else. So bringing it back to fairy tale justice, I would say that fairy tale justice really hit it on the nose in its mimicking of court TV like Judge Judy because the judge got to say whatever she wanted. She just asked both sides for their sides. They were able to present witnesses or evidence or whatever they wanted to. And then the judge made a determination and like there were very, there were no rules of evidence. Nothing was followed that was like formal in any way. Accurate. The only part of this that wasn't accurate to Judge Judy and those types of shows is at the end, she was threatening Goldilocks with community service. This is not criminal court. It's not even real court. It's arbitration and arbitrators can't sentence parties to like any sort of criminal punishment, like a community service or probation or jail. All they can do is tell people to give each other money, basically, or settlement of some sort. So that that was a little inaccurate. But otherwise, they nailed it. Minus, you know, the talking stuffed animals, but thoroughly entertaining nonetheless. That's the overview of Judge Judy, fairy tale justice, and how court TV shows actually work. I hope you learned a little something. I had a fun time researching this and watching the TV show. Again, check out my Drag Race review series over on my other channel. It's also available in podcast form. Anywhere you get your podcasts, just search for Drag Me with Legia Miller and you'll find me. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.